After 9-11, I started thinking about flight simulators and building my own version of one. And so I did. So she's got two joysticks. Left spins you left. Right spins you right. And then there's wind and fire. <laughs> it's kind of definitely a learning curve to this one. <laughs> San Francisco's gritty South Side. This place has become a mecca for the growing numbers of artists like Cal Spelitich, who create works that are too big, too loud, and too dangerous for close quarters. They're drawn here by the wide open spaces, the low rent, and ready access to the detritus of modern society. We live on the edge of San Francisco. There's a little more elbow room to do stuff, and it's a little post-apocalyptic in some ways. And we can kind of feast off of people's leftovers. And, you know, of course, uh, one man's trash is another man's treasure. We're gonna look for stuff. Bill, what do you got for me today? What are you looking for? I don't know. I know when I see it. San Francisco is the epicenter for machine art because this is an art and technology hub of the world because of Silicon Valley. We can get the second and third generation hardware from those people. There's a bearing, positively. Do a little Duchamp piece. Obtainium is a term that's been used in our machine art world for decades. You have this ob obtainium vision on, and it's like a camera inside your head, and you're looking for hardware or gear or technology. Places like Ace Auto Supply are like the National Endowment for the Arts for me. Free hardware for my next sculpture. Well, I got a couple things, Bill. Oh, you got a drive belt. Yes, yes. And three pulleys. Okay. And this is good. This is the head punching machine. So needless to say, he really busts himself up a lot and is constantly breaking, which is part of it. We'll put a GW on there, and then when it spins, it'll spin around, and it is all that little flat forehead. Welding for me allows me to work with materials that are really strong. I mean, I just always just thought of it as like a hot glue gun that sticks stuff together, but hot glue guns generally are good for paper, cardboard, and maybe light wood. And you can build a, a head punching machine with that, but it wouldn't be very sturdy and wouldn't give you the punch. Cal began working on cars at age 15 in his hometown of Davenport, Iowa. Since then, he's earned two degrees in interdisciplinary art and created a unique body of works that fuses his mechanical prowess, a punk rock aesthetic, and a passion for new forms of audience interaction. His growing collection of machines has been featured in more than a thousand performances throughout the US, Canada, and Europe. A big goal of a lot of my machines I build are the sounds they make and getting um, an interesting or intense sound out of each machine. And that gives, I feel like, a voice to the piece. Everything I build, I always kind of make sure I don't know how to make it when I start. And so, in the end, you end up with an invention. It's kind of applicationless engineering, I guess. 
We're not trying to apply this to a market. Always searching for new ways to engage audiences more directly with his artworks, Cal has started experimenting with biofeedback technology. Many of his latest creations are actually controlled by his subject's blood pressure or heart rate, making the artwork a direct physical manifestation of their escalating excitement and fear. I have this blood pressure cuff that is sending a signal to this air valve that triggers a pneumatic cylinder that opens and closes the mouth. I kind of like this. I think it's a go. It's the first time I've ever tried it, and it's very sensitive and quite awkward to do in a live setting and get it to work exactly how you want it. But I think part of that difficulty is part of the fun. So I'm going to try this tomorrow night, I think. When I don't understand it or know exactly what the piece is going to do, then it's interesting. If I can in interject enough kind of wild cards or loose elements to them, or just a live audience, it becomes much more interesting. It becomes potentially dangerous, which is very interesting. And I think a lot of people come to see my work for that danger element. I'm hoping that maybe I can see some creative expression out of these mechanical objects. That's kind of what I was expecting, a lot of like dangerous art. So that's kind of what appealed to me, I guess. I think adults like to play with toys too. It's just that there's very few toys that are really built for adults. Let's see, for a couple, two and a half decades now, I've been reading about black holes and I'm not sure I really still understand them or that I'm supposed to understand them. What I do understand is it's a passageway with a lot of energy. And suppose if you get enough energy in that passageway, um, what happens? Time bends and shapes and shifts and spins. I believe it. So you're gonna get up here and you can step right on here okay. and get up in the life flight gurney. I don't really think art is even interesting anymore until people are engaged with it. And how do you engage this modern society or culture? You almost have to pick them up and lift them and spin them and pull them right into it. Dealing with fear on a primal level is a heavy thing. And, and there's something deep, deep in our genes that have us fight or flight. Either you deal with it or you run away and hide. Something happens to that person, they have a transformative moment. That is interesting. And that's when I reach my audience. This is probably the most dangerous thing in the show. <laughs> Just to be honest, if that got loose, it'd be a sad day. I definitely fear that people will be hurt, and it would be quite traumatic if someone did get hurt, and would probably change my approach to art making. And at the same time, how can you push that envelope where there's a sense of fear or danger? Things become interesting when your life is a little out of whack. So I build my work to go right to that edge.